seems to be blinking. So we are dealing with, of course, uh, our final and major topic in this course, actually. It's uh, regression analysis. Um, So we started just uh, briefly last week to talk about uh, multiple regression models, um, which means basically we have a dependent variable and then we have some number of independent variables. So the linear models can look like this, for instance, if we have three uh, independent variables, three x variables. So we have this linear function plus this random error term. So this is a multiple linear <coughs> regression model. And basically we can look just to the end of this lecture five note or chapter five note one um, note here. We we looked at some of these things previous week, but uh, the idea is of course the same as in the single variable model which we studied, is to to look at some data and then try to to find values for these uh, parameters that gives us the best linear function that sort of explains the relation with these x data here and the y data here. So we want to express this guy as a linear function on this and based on a set of data we uh, can make our estimates. And this part is, is mathematically actually simple, although it looks slightly nasty. Um, we are doing exactly the same as we did with the single variable model, only the problem now it's very difficult to draw a picture. Because to draw a picture of this relation here, it's a function y that is a function of three other variables. So you would have to have a four-dimensional um, coordinate system. And if you can draw that and understand it, you probably have taken some strong drugs or something. So while it's very easy to take this picture here, here is my x data and my y data. And I know that some of these So I can draw this picture and I can say this linear function is probably a nice fit to my data because I have small residuals, which I call EI. I cannot draw this picture when I have three x variables. But I can imagine that I do exactly the same. I look at my data, which are now y's and then three x variables. So these are just numbers. Then I put up some linear function and then I can measure how well does this fit with my data by com com uh, comparing the value of this linear function for each row when I insert the x's. So this will be the, the estimated y value with a particular model and this is the actually observed y value. So I'm saying that I'm going to take the square sum of all such deviations and I'm just going to pick the B0, B1, B2 and B3 that minimizes this square sum. I'm not going to be able to draw the picture but I can do in principle the math and I will allow SPSS to do the computations for me but this is how it, the estimation is going. So it's the same 
It's the minimum. It's the least squares method again. And we're still going to call SSE is the sum of squares of the residuals when this is minimized, right? So the coefficient estimates that I get, I mean, these are theoretical parameters, but these are particular estimates. They come from minimizing this sum. OK. So we're not going to do any calculations like this. We're going to leave everything to SPSS. But it's good to know what's happening. Um, So what we're actually going to do, which might be a bit frustrating for you maybe, but we're going to focus mainly on what are the problems now, or what is difficult with uh, multiple regression. We're not going to focus on what is the same as before mainly. Um, so while it's, it's quite simple usually to interpret coefficient estimates in a single regression model like this. We can have some trouble with this when we go to a multiple uh, regression model. And this comes mainly when you have correlation between the x variables here, as we will see some examples of. So let's see. Maybe I can do just a few small examples. at some data here. Uh, this is typically at some kind of data that you might want to use a linear regression or at least some regression analysis to analyze. So it's the prices of used cars. see the price this is selling price in x thousand Norwegian kroner and we may say for instance there are several variables here but I'm not going to use all of them uh, thank God <laughs> um, but let's pick a few of them. So one very important uh, determining factor for the selling price of a car should be the new price, right? So a 300,000 kroner car should be cheaper after five years than a 600,000 car, of course. So we say x1 is the new price. should be maybe the, the age. This should be a very important driver for the price of a used car. If it's five years or ten years, it should matter a lot. And thirdly, the mileage, yes. And there should be an L. So this is the distance gone in kilometers. And we all know that the car that has gone 300,000 kilometers should, if everything else is similar, should be, be cheaper than one that's gone 100,000 kilometers, for instance. So that should, all of those should somehow matter. Um, so let me show you first. Uh, this is partly to show you multiple regression in SPSS and partly to show you problems with correlation. So. Um, let me look at the sequence here. Yeah. So it's the same menu, regression, linear. And we choose a dependent variable, in this case the price. 
So this is what I want to try to explain. And then I want to see whether some other of these variables affects the price in a significant way, right? And through a linear model. So I put in the new price, the age, and the mileage here. And I, I might want to see some confidence intervals, right? Um, so what we are going to get from SPSS are now, among other things, coefficient estimates for these parameters. And I want to see confidence intervals also. So we can do something like this and then click OK. I will discuss more details about this later on, but now I just want to show you some trouble that might happen. Um, yeah, so this looks good. You get an R square that is in like 99%. So we're explaining a lot of the price with these three variables. Um, here is the coefficient output. Let's see, what do we get? Yeah, so you get some uh, coefficients here. So for instance, the age coefficient is about minus 10 in this estimate. So that means in isolation, another year strips in this model 10,000 of the price. And here is the coefficient for the mileage. So another 1,000 kilometers in this representation uh, reduces the price with, uh, what would that be? Some 130 kroner or something. It's not important, but uh, you can interpret these figures in that way. OK, so this is one model. Now look at what happens here if I do. The same, I just kick out the age variable here now. So I have t I keep two of the variables, but I kick out the age. Um, and we get a new regression. Now you see, the we kick out something that is probably an important uh, factor for the price. So our R square drops to 90. So we lose a lot of uh, our explanatory power, as it's called. But something else also happens. If you look at the coefficient that we had for this mileage factor, or mi mileage variable, it was uh, So if I say this is B3 in model number one was about minus one point or zero point, um, say 13. While the estimate in the second model is And if you look at the confidence interval here in this in the <coughs> in the second model, it's uh, from minus zero point eighty eighty five to minus zero seventy two something. 
while this estimate is very close to zero. So zero here is B three for model two with the confidence interval, and here is B three from the first model. So what I'm trying to say now, and if you look at the confidence interval in this first model, it will look probably something like this. So this tries to say that my beta tree is here, and the other one tries to say that the beta tree is here. And those two pictures don't go along. So what is actually going on here is that those betas that I usually we put the same letter there, but they are different parameters really because this is supposing that we don't consider age in the model while this is um, no it was the the opposite so this is without age in model and this is with age And what's the difference? Well, you realize, of course, that the age of a car and the mileage of a car are heavily correlated. Okay, we can even check that since we have SPSs um, correlate by variate the age and the mileage. is about 0 0.88. So you can imagine intuitively what happens. What this parameter represents is you're trying to guess um, the price of a car and you only get to know what it was costing when it was new and how many kilometers it was driven. You don't know anything about the age. But if you see 300,000 kilometers, you're going to automatically assume that it's going to be an old car. So that 300,000 km, it has two impacts. It has one just for the kilometers, but also m more heavily because of the high age. But in the other model, or what I call the first model, I already included the age. So in this case, your s this parameter beta 3 is your weight when you want to guess the price of a car with this new price, and it's you're told that it's 10 years old, and then you're told it's gone 300,000 kilometers. So this parameter just makes the adjustment for kilometers when you already know the age. So it's, um, this is the marginal sort of KM cost, or what you will call it, uh, given age is known. So in this case, this estimate doesn't sort of uh, include anything about the age, because the age is already known in a way. So it's just a correction for a 10-year-old car if it's gone 200 or 300,000 kilometers. Of course, there's a correction, but it's not that huge. But if you only get to see the 200,000 or 300,000 kilometers, you're going to have to guess that the 300,000 kilometer car is a three, four years older than the 200,000 kilometer year. So the price impact of the coefficient here is much higher. So I'm not sure if this uh, makes uh, or, or if it's completely clear what I'm saying here, but this is what you want to see a lot in multiple regression that uh, coefficient em estimates, they will change very often when you add new variables to the equation, right? 
So it's not possible to, to in isolation, to say what is the extra um, value loss for another thousand kilometers. You have to see that in relation to what all the variables you're discussing in the moment. So this is what I'm saying. Uh, we are focusing somewhat on problems, not discussing what is easy. It's really easy to run regression analysis with 10 variables, for instance, but it's not so easy to, or this correlation with x variables causes some problems. Right. So this is basically where I wanted to stop last week, I guess. Um, So let's look at the next one. And we'll discuss very briefly the basic assumptions for the linear multiple model. So if you look at A, B, C, and D, they are just perfectly the same as before. There is, um, well, it's basically assumptions on this error term all the way. So it's going to be normally distributed. It's going to be having the same standard deviation independent of the x variables and so on. Now, the new thing is this E condition. And this says, Simply, it's very related to the problem that I just showed you, but it's, it sort of tries to strip away the most extreme case of that. So it says no variable can be a linear function of the other x variables. So no, supposing x i is, or x 2 is 3 plus 4 x 1 minus 7 x 2 then x2 is a linear, f or say x3. Then x2 is a linear function of the two others, and this is going to ruin the regression procedure because it's not going to be possible to determine the coefficient estimates, actually. So I have a small example just to show you what happens if you violate this thing. And you can either appreciate it or ignore it, I guess. But um, it's just to explain what, what really happens and why we need this assumption. So it's stripped down to the most easy situation where you have two x variables and you want to estimate, uh, of course, an equation like this based on some, some data. Now you have y, you have x1, and you have x2. Um, so suppose y is, uh, it can be whatever, 7, 4, 19, 21, x1 is 2, 4, 6, 4. And the condition E would be violated if this variable was a perfect linear function of this one. Right, so suppose we can estimate, and of course we can do that. If we have some data like that, we could estimate an equation with only y and x1. So you run this in SPSS and you find easily 8 plus 2x1. So this is the best linear function that describes the dependency between these two. Now suppose that this is violated 
for this regression. So uh, then x2 should be a perfect linear function of x1. And in this case, we're just assuming that it's 2 plus 4 x1. So x2 equals 2 plus 4 x1. So this means, in practice, then, that the data here are not independent of these at all. So we can actually calculate this variable based on knowing this one. So it should be 2 plus 4x1. If this is 2, it's 8. So it should be 10. If you insert 2 here, if you insert 4 there, you get 16 plus 2. It's 18. If 6, 4 times 6 is 24 plus 2 is 26. And then 18 again. So and you might have this data, but now this is perfectly a linear function of this one. Okay. So this is Yeah, and I I want um, so we want to determine the coefficients for the original model here, right? So we want some parameters that will give me this. OK, so in principle, we could use regression to estimate the coefficient for this. But I know that x2 is 2 plus 4 x1. So I can insert my x2 expression in here to get b0 plus b1 x1 plus b2 times 2 plus 4 x1. Since this is always the case, I can just insert it there. And now I can do some calculation here. So I get, for constants, I get b0 plus 2 b2. Plus, and then there's now only one x variable left because I eliminated x2 from here. So it's b1 plus 4b2 times x1. OK, so because of this complete linear relation, my original three or two variable expression can be boiled down to a one variable expression like this. And my SPSS estimation when I used only this variable was, was this one. So I kind of know the best linear relationship between x1 and y is this one. And the thing now is if I can sort of make b0 plus 2b2, this is the constant term in the, in the two variable expression here. If this is equal to 8, and b1 plus 4b2 is equal to 2. Um, what can I say? This makes. the same model. So what I'm saying in a slightly awkward way here now is that any choices of the three parameters here that satisfies these two equations will give you 
in practice the same equation up here, right? So they look different, but they are actually the same because they all expresses y as a times two plus a two times x one. And then the issue is there are um, an infinite number of different choices of parameters that does that for me. So I have a few examples here. I just need to make these two go up. So I can do b0 equal 8, b1 equals 2, b2 equals 0. So this is one possible choice of parameters for the original model that gives me this. Because I have 8 plus 0 is 8, of course. Um, 2 plus 4 times 0 is 2. But also, I can take b0 equals to 4. I can take um, b1 equal minus 6 and b2 equal 2. And I simply get the same expression in the end when I isolate it down to x1. So there's no possible way to say that these parameter estimates are better than this one because they gave the same function. So there's not possible, impossible. I'm writing like a pig, parameters. Or the right parameter values, I should really say. To put it in a different way, when you ask SPSS to minimize the square sum of errors, it will just freak out because there is a million or infinitely many different combinations that gives you the same minimum. So it cannot say that, wow, oh, it's this one, because this one is just perfectly as good as that. OK. So maybe that's not easy to understand, but it's, you can sort of analyze it in this way. Another more intuitive way to say it maybe is when you look at this relationship, you see that the information that is created in the x1 variable is the variation here. This is replicated perfectly by this one. OK? So if you. If you have a linear function and you number your observations like this, and x1 goes here, 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 and here, then maybe x2 goes here, 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 and here. So it just replicates exactly the same pattern of variation, but maybe on a different scale. So when you ask SPSS to say which of these two are causing my y vari variable to vary, it's not possible to see. Because you can say it's all because of the x1, or it's all because of the x2, or it's half of each. It's not possible to say. So that's why we need this additional assumption. And this is also related closely to the problem um, that we get when they are not perfectly cor correlated like this. This is 100% correlation. And that's un illegal. But if you have like 90% correlation, we have, it's not illegal, but we get some trouble. So we see we get some trouble by interpreting the coefficients when you have a large correlation between the variables. 
So in that case, they are not exactly replicating the pattern of variation. There is a little bit of difference, but it's mainly the same thing. So it's still difficult to say that the variation is caused by this or that. So the solution, of course, if you have complete linear dependency between variables, you just have to kick something out. Um, and you, in this case, you use only x1 or only x2, and you get the, basically the same model of the world. Yeah. OK, now I maybe I've scared scared you a little bit about multiple regression, but this is maybe the most difficult part of it in, in one way. So um, you just have to live with this uh, situation and be aware of it so, so uh, we don't get fooled by the coefficient estimates. Uh, right, so in real life, when you see something that is 100% correlated in your data, you just eliminate some of them. But in practice, you have something that is not 100%. Um, and you just have to deal with it. Sometimes things are correlated because they are related to the same uh, aspect of something. For instance, the mileage and the age of a car, it's somehow related. So you might make a combined index or something that measures this underlying thing. But we have to think about correlation all the time when we do multiple regression. So you're going to have to play a little bit with this again when you do exercise 5.1. It's more or less the same as I showed you before. And as yeah, this is what I showed you in the beginning. These two models are very different. So when you write beta 3 here, as the coefficient for mileage, it's something different in these two models, even though it represents the same variable here. Yeah. So there's a moral in this that's summarizing just what I've said, basically. Always consider coefficient estimates in light of what is already in the model. OK, so that's the uh, end of the horror, maybe. <laughs> um, what we do in SPSS, well, as I showed you, it's the same menu. You now specify one dependent, the y. And as many as you like, actually of independent. Variables. And basically, we're going to, I mean, if you want to estimate the model with all of these variables, you choose the method called enter. And then the output is essentially the same. You get the coefficient statistics. That's the beta estimates. You get this ANOVA thing that we are going to discuss a little bit. It's the same as before with these square sums. And you get a model summary, which consists of the R square and uh, the estimate of this, uh, well, the SE thing. It's the estimate of this, the standard deviation of the error term. 
So we're going to take it in turn as it comes. Um, It's a very nice point to take a break. You know, just waiting for this projector to <laughs> shut down to give me an excuse, but uh, <laughs> didn't help me. Let's take a break for 15 minutes here. Stop the video. So.